Hello there. Welcome to Planet America's Fireside Chat. I'm John Barron. And I'm Jazza Jadalo. This week, an update for you on the presidential campaign of 2024 with a bunch of new polls, some offering clues to Trump and Biden's respective strengths and weaknesses, Chaz. Well, one of Biden's biggest weaknesses is the situation on America's southern border. We're going to talk to a migration policy expert about what's currently happening and what could fix things. But first... <laughs> A new poll from South Carolina offers only modest encouragement for Nikki Haley as she campaigns to claim her home state primary coming up in three weeks from now. According to this Monmouth poll, Haley has jumped 14 points since their last poll in the Palmetto State back in September. The bad news for Haley is that Trump is up by almost as much as the field has narrowed. He's up 12 points. 26 points ahead. And after months of gloomy national polls for Joe Biden, a few signs of hope this unpopular incumbent this week, a poll from Quinnipiac had Joe Biden opening up a six-point lead over Trump nationally. Biden up three in a month and Trump down two. Interestingly, driving that poll bounce for Biden, a five-point increase in support for Biden among Women voters giving the Democrat a 22-point advantage on that score. The majority of men, though, continue to back Donald Trump. He's picked up another 2% of the blokes. And this same poll showed Nikki Haley would beat Joe Biden by 5 percentage points. And yet, Donald Trump still leads Haley in a head-to-head -head national primary poll by a cool 56 points. That's up another 10 points from last month. Haley has also scooped up another 10% support there, Chaz. That's all very interesting, but let me add to the Quinnipiac poll, yeah. something else that's interesting. That's the one where Biden was ahead by six points. Yes. When you throw Robert F. Kennedy Jr. into the mix... Mm -hmm. And he is in the mix. He is in the mix. That six-point margin becomes a two-point margin, 39 mm. to 37, and RFK gets 14 points. The reason why I keep on going on about him, even though at the moment he's only on the ballot in Utah and New Hampshire, New mm. Hampshire is a swing state, Utah, not so much, and you need to be on the ballot for people to vote for you, but the reason I keep on going on about him is this week he hinted he might join the Libertarian Party and mm. run with them. If he runs with them, he's on all 50, 50 states' ballots. Yeah. So those 14-point margins in national polls become very relevant very quickly. Yeah. Now, we're, we're going to find that out in the next couple of weeks. That alone might be the biggest issue for the entire election, whether RFK mm. gets on 50 mm. states or not. Yeah, and of course, cast our mind back to 2016, mm. Gary Johnson, as a libertarian, along with Jill Stein as a Green, who is also running again in 2024, they were a significant factor mm. in Trump's victory over Hillary Clinton. I want to, though, um, hark back a little bit, Chaz, to that poll of, uh, of female support for Joe Biden yes. going up. There's no, there's no proof of this theory yet, but I want to keep an eye on this because the longer that the Trump-Haley primary goes, we know that Nikki Haley is attracting lots of moderate independent voters. Yep. The anti-Trump Republicans, that are mainly only 20% of Republican voters, are anti-Trump at this stage. She's got them. But seeing more women now supporting Joe Biden over Donald Trump, I suggest that maybe Donald Trump referring to Nikki Haley as bird brain, unqualified to be president, is adding to this drive of female voters away from Donald Trump and into the hands of both Haley and Joe Biden. And if that is true, the longer this primary continues, the more Donald Trump is seen to be beating up on a female candidate, the better it is going to be for Joe Biden in the long run. That, that well could activate female voters. I should point out that at least so far in mm. Iowa and New Hampshire, there's been no gender gap mm. for Nikki mm. Haley over Donald Trump amongst Republicans. Yeah. That doesn't mean this won't happen, what you just said, mm. especially if he keeps on going on with it. So we'll see about that. While we're, we're talking polls, another one which is interesting, the, the Quinnipiac one, positive for Joe Biden. Mm. Another one wasn't so positive. That's the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll. State now, by state. State yeah. by state polls. And, and the critical states. I'm actually going to quote Dean Phillips here, the, mm. a, a, one of uh, uh, Biden's Democratic, uh, Democratic opponents. Mm. Uh, he tweeted out, Swing states Trump leading, according to this poll, Wisconsin plus five, Pennsylvania plus three, Nevada plus eight, Georgia plus eight, Michigan plus five, North Carolina plus 10, Arizona plus three, swing states Biden leading, dash. Mm. That's not a good result for Joe Biden. I will say this, though. That's not the only poll he's looking at. He's looking at economic polls, in particular the polls on economic approval, because so much of running for re-election as an incumbent is the economy. 
uh, we've talked about this on, on previous shows, yeah. uh, Gallup have their own poll, their Economic Confidence Index, and if you have a look at that right now, you can see it's up by six points from last month, 14 points since November. It's still not, still not great, minus mm. 26, but that's the highest it's been since January 2022 and going up, largely so far because of Democrats, mm. not independents or Republicans, but start somewhere. Joe Biden will be watching that very closely. And I'll tell you why that's not spin. You go, that sounds like Democrat spin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just Democrats. No, it's not spin. I'll tell you why. Look at Trump. This is what he had to say recently, <laughs> this week. This is the Trump stock market because my polls against Biden are so good that investors are projecting that I will win and that will drive the market <laughs> up. So Trump is now trying to claim... The economy the... is so good in anticipation of how great it's going to be when Trump's back. Exactly. When Trump's nice. trying to spin the great economy as mm. he's doing in advance, yeah. you know he's seen the economy slipping away from him as an issue. Yeah. So I think this is a real thing. Yeah, and these state-based polls are fascinating. We, we talked late last year about those quite devastating New York Times-Siena polls for Joe Biden that had him losing six of the seven swing states. They didn't have North Carolina in amongst those. There have been some other state-based pollsters, though, in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin that have Joe Biden a couple of points in front, uh, and some more of those economic indicators are looking better for Joe Biden. Very interesting that that national poll has swung towards Biden just in the last couple of weeks. That could be an outlier, of course, but it is uh, it is significant because... That could be both be true. Yeah, all, the, all these things can yeah. be true at once. And we yeah. do know that uh, even if Donald Trump wins the uh, the Electoral College and the presidency in November, Joe Biden could still have 3 or 4% higher national vote just because of the way that the, the, the popular vote works out in those big blue states like New York and California. That's where Biden's going to rack up the score. So, once again, this is an election that's going to come down to maybe 50,000 voters in suburban and Atlanta and, and Pittsburgh and a few of these crucial swing districts in swing states. The boffins say three states this is coming down to. I'm mm. not going to say what those three states are yet. I'm going to give it a little bit more time, but that's mm. what they're saying. Yeah, well, we'll see about <laughs> that. This weekend is the first official Democratic presidential primary. It is in South Carolina. Last week's New Hampshire primary was technically unofficial for the Democrats. It was in breach of party rules uh, because they were not supposed to go first in the nation. There were no delegates awarded as a result, even though Joe Biden easily won that just as a write-in candidate, not even on the ballot. Well, this weekend, Joe Biden is on the ballot. And the polls, well, they've been pretty thin on the ground um, because nobody really thinks that Joe Biden's in trouble no. in this primary, so they're not bothering to pay for polls. But it does look as though Joe Biden is set for another easy win this weekend. An Emerson poll, which came out a month ago, now, so it's a little bit mouldy. It had Biden 64 points ahead of his nearest rival. That's Congressman Dean Phillips of yep. Minnesota. Self-help author Marianne Williamson is on just 3% in that poll. South Carolina, of course, was crucial to Joe Biden's win back in 2020 in the primaries after he had performed rather poorly in Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada as well. His big comeback was in South Carolina. South Carolina, it's a much more diverse state. 30% of the population there are African Americans, about 80% of them are Democrats. Iowa, on the other hand, which has been up until now first to vote for Democrats as well as Republicans, it's about 4% African American. Although uh, you can also argue, well, New Hampshire, it's a swing state. Iowa used to be a swing state. It's become very Republican in the last decade. South Carolina is actually a solidly Republican state overall. So, this doesn't really tell us anything except about that African-American vote. Is Joe Biden still able to motivate that 30% of the population in South Carolina who are African-Americans, which will tell us whether he's able to motivate African-Americans nationally in November because his numbers have softened significantly there. And this is the first real-world test of, OK, you can tell a pollster you're going to vote or you're not going to vote, you're not enthusiastic or whatever. Are they going to come out to vote this weekend when nobody really thinks it's a contested primary? Are they going to want to show a force? Or if they stay at home, does Biden start sounding the alarm bells? Yeah, especially amongst young African-Americans. There's mm. a real question mark about that. The Talking about young voters, we've talked about them obsessively when it comes to Democrats and how they've softened recently. Mm. There was an interesting bit of data which I want to share with you guys um, the, uh, from New Hampshire, from the, from the Democratic primary in New Hampshire. Like mm. John said, not a very important primary. It wasn't official, whatever. Yeah. But there was a move for people to fill in the writing as writing candidate, not just Joe Biden, but ceasefire. Mm. 
Instead of. Instead of Joe yes, Biden, yes. Yeah. Ceasefire. Yeah. And, then, and the idea was, if you're a Liberal Democrat, they knew the primary didn't matter. That's a way of registering as a protest, mm. to, to, to write in ceasefire as their vote. Now, if you, I, I, I can't find the full state write-in results because they don't publicise them a lot, mm. but they did publicise the, the results from Nashua, which is a very Liberal enclave, white Liberal enclave, mm. the kind mm. of place you would expect there to be a lot of anti-war people. Yes. And the results of the write-in votes I've got for you right here, uh, well, Joe Biden had a million, don't worry about them, mm. but there were 47 votes for ceasefire in mm. Nashua. Mm. There were 264 votes, write-in votes, for Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. And there were 177 write-in votes for Donald Trump in the Democratic primary. Mm. So I don't think there was a huge groundswell of support for the ceasefire write-in vote. Yeah. So we'll see how this how this plays out over the next little while, mm. but it's possible that people are protesting without necessarily not following through with their vote or staying home. We'll find yeah. out. South Carolina will be the first test. Yeah, indeed it will. This week, the full cost of the failed presidential campaign of Ron DeSantis was finally revealed. While the DeSantis campaign itself spent a relatively modest $28.3 million last year, the pro-DeSantis super PAC, a political action committee known as Never Back Down, managed to burn through an eye-watering $131 million, all for that distant second-place finish in Iowa before DeSantis dropped out of the race. Still, must be said... The DeSantis campaign is far from the first high-priced file in American politics. That's Giuliani, then mayor of New York, in drag. You know, you're really beautiful. It's hard to believe now, but there was a time when Rudy Giuliani was the Republican frontrunner for the presidency of the United States. This may be the best of all. And let's not forget this. She's 15. She's too old for you. What, what, she, why are you no, she's my daughter. Please, take me instead. Running to succeed George W. Bush in 2008, Rudy led rivals, including John McCain and Mitt Romney, by double digits in national polls. Rudy Giuliani! The former New York City mayor was one of the best-known politicians in the country. America needs a leader who's ready. I'm Rudy Giuliani, and I approve this message. <laughs> Rudy was generally moderate and pro-choice on abortion, which helped him in those national polls, but not with the conservative base of the Republican Party. Giuliani gambled on winning big states and largely skipped Iowa's caucuses, where he finished sixth, then fourth in New Hampshire, sixth in Michigan, Nevada and South Carolina. He put all his chips on winning Florida on January 29th. Florida should count, Miami should count. And these people have made a very big statement today. Not big enough. Rudy finished third and it was all over. Rudy had spent over $65 million and failed to win a single state. So you don't think your biggest mistake was bypassing the early primaries and betting everything on Florida? No, no, the Florida plan was a solid plan. <laughs> It was a disaster, but not the most expensive disaster in recent decades, not by a long shot. In 2000, publishing billionaire Steve Forbes ran for the Republican presidential nomination for the second time in a field led by George W. Bush and John McCain. I think we'll make a very credible showing in Iowa. Forbes spent $86 million of his own money and, like Rudy, he failed to win a single primary. We were nosed out by a landslide. <laughs> yeah, Mitt Romney hasn't gotten a very good return on his investment uh, during this presidential campaign. In 2008, Mitt Romney spent $114 million on his primary campaign. About $35 million of that came from his own pocket. In return, he won 11 states, finishing third behind John McCain and Mike Huckabee. This isn't an easy decision. I hate to lose. But Romney's decision to make an early exit did set him up to win the nomination four years later. I'm Ted Cruz, and we approve this message. In 2016, Ted Cruz spent $142 million, coming second to Donald Trump. Along the way, Cruz won 11 states, including first to vote Iowa. He stayed in the primary through until May. We gave it everything we've got. But the voters chose another path. The same year, Jeb Bush had burnt through $152 million. 
a substantially less effect. The early poll leader had no answer to Trump's brash style of anti-politics and Jeb failed to win a single state. I love you all. God bless you. Would you like some water? Fellow Floridian Marco Rubio spent even more than Jeb on his 2016 campaign, $165 million. He won three states and finished third behind Trump and Cruz. So far, all of the big spending campaign failures have been Republicans. Now we come to Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders, the independent who ran twice for the Democratic presidential nomination. So are you guys ready for a radical idea? In 2020, Sanders was the frontrunner for a time until the party closed ranks behind Joe Biden. Bernie won eight state primaries before dropping out as COVID swept America. But he still managed to spend over $200 million on that second place finish. All in 2016, Sanders had proved to be a surprisingly strong challenger to Hillary Clinton. He spent a whopping $223 million for a second place finish in the primaries, carrying 22 states. A good performance, but still the third most expensive flop in history. And in the event of an unexpected drop in poll numbers, this plane will be diverted to New Hampshire. The second costliest campaign to fall short was Hillary Clinton's drawn-out battle for the 2008 Democratic presidential nomination against Barack Obama. Could a woman really serve as commander-in-chief? Clinton stayed in that campaign until June 7th, when all of the votes had been cast. She'd won 23 primaries and caucuses and just 42,000 fewer votes overall than Obama out of 35 million cast. From now on, it will be unremarkable for a woman to win primary state victories. The final bill for Hillary's campaign, $250 million. I've been very lucky, made a lot of money, and I'm giving it all away. But the prize for the most expensive and least successful presidential campaign goes to Mike Bloomberg, and it's not even close. We cannot mm. afford four more years of President Trump's reckless and unethical actions. Another billionaire publisher with high hopes for high office in a 2020 campaign lasting just 101 days, Mike Bloomberg spent... Drum roll, please. $935 million. That's more than Hillary, Bernie and Marco's flops put together, all to finish fourth, winning just one contest in the territory of American Samoa. No campaign has ever accomplished as much as you did in such a short period of time. Well, that is kind of true. And at least it was his own money that he wasted. Now to probably the hottest topic of the week in the United States, that of immigration, Chaz. And there has been a lot of seemingly over-the-top talk about an invasion across the southern border yes. and civil war breaking out. Now, <laughs> in a sense, this is, this is more than just rhetoric because there is kind of a legal basis for what is happening now, which is essentially a standoff between federal authorities and state authorities in Texas, all over border security. And it's centred around... And I want you to have a look at this. It's an aerial view of Shelby Park in a small part of Texas called Eagle Pass. That's the Rio Grande River you can see there. That, the border runs down that. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's kind of in a suburban area on both sides of the US-Mexico border there. So this is, a, this is a riverfront park which has now become kind of the battlefront not literally, but certainly in terms of the sort of the effort to stop illegal arrivals across the river. Yeah, I'm going to try and cover this as quickly as I can. Uh, essentially, the feds have been using Shelby Park as the place where they process migrants when they cross the river. Because yeah. this is a place where the migrants like to cross the river a lot. Now, uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, he he s basically seized the park, covered it with concertina wire, which is like barbed wire, razor wire. Yep. Yep. So that the so that migrants can't get into the park. And also, so the feds can't get into the park. He actually sealed it off and didn't let the feds in. Now, there's been all sorts of toing and froing, which I'll talk about in PEP if you're interested, but this is going to take too long to do now. But the important thing is the Supreme Court, at, at some point in time, the feds wanted to cut the wire to potentially rescue people, 
but at least to get access to potential migrants, which is and, their and job. And this is a very real concern because a mother and daughter drowned in the river earlier in January because they could not be rescued uh, and... Oh, you, 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 I need to pull you off on that. Uh, there's, been, there's, there's been a lot of confusion about that. They actually drowned before the signal went out. But what happened then was there, there were some other, other people who were... Other migrants who were in trouble. Yes. Who were struggling. And then the feds tried to help them. Yes. And the Texas, the Texas Guard would not let them in. Yep. Mexico saved them. And they were fine. And but the and people who died important? died before the. This right. Important. Okay. Good. Um, this is important because the boat ramp is in the park. Yes. So for Customs and Border Protection to want to put their rubber ducks into the into the river, that's the point they use in this stretch of the river. That's correct. Now it's been going to and fro in the Supreme Court. Who has access? Who can? Whether whether Texas can build the wire, whether the Feds can cut the wire. The Supreme Court the other week ruled that, well, they gave a temporary ruling before they listened mm -hmm. to it properly, the case, that the feds have the right to cut the wire. Yep. They did not say anything about whether Texas has the right to put the wire there in the first place, OK? Yep. So at this point in time, there was no ruling for, uh, for Texas at all. It was just about the feds being yes. allowed to cut the wire. They did not... The feds did not try to cut the wire. They were, that, that was just where we were at. Mm. And then Greg Abbott went feral. He put out a statement basically asserting the right to defend Texas and impl imp implying that the Supreme Court was stopping him defending Texas, even though they had not said he can't put the wire up, right? Mm. And uh, he cited... This is where the invasion comes from. He yeah. cited the Constitution, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, where it says, ''No state shall engage in war unless actually invaded.'' And he said, we've been invaded by migrants, so therefore we now get to defend ourselves over the top of the feds, even though the feds should have the rights to, to control any area within 25 miles of the border. We, uh, our self-defence takes precedent because we've been invaded. So yeah. that's where the, all the invasion talk comes from, OK? Yeah. Yeah. I want to emphasise, the Supreme Court did not rule against Texas. The Supreme Court said nothing about Texas. This is all a fiction. Yeah. He's building up and Republicans bit. Uh, for instance, Clay Higgins then said, feds are staging a civil war and Texas should stand their ground. The Supreme Court had done nothing about this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 25 Republican governors sent their support, staying in solidarity with Greg Abbott. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt actually suggested that the Republican interpretation of the Constitution should take precedence over the Supreme Court. We all agree that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. I think the Constitution supersedes somebody in Washington, D.C. telling it. So, so he's talking about overturning the Supreme Court. Mm. Right? Which hasn't ruled. Which hasn't ruled. Mm. Meantime, Democrats were trying to escalate at the same time as well. Beto O'Rourke <laughs> tweeted out, Abbott is using the Texas Guard to defy a Supreme Court ruling. He was not defying a Supreme Court ruling. Mm. Uh, and then he said that, that Biden should federalise the National Guard to ensure compliance with the law. Which So they're now, they're, now they're fighting over whether the Texas National Guard is going to be national, controlled by Biden or controlled by... By, uh, by, by Greg Abbott and other states are starting to send their National Guard down and there could be a, a battle between National Guards and National Guards. Mm -hmm. It's all very confusing and all completely unnecessary because mm. the Supreme Court did not rule mm. anything. Mm -hmm. It's just complete posing. Yeah, and, and it's also important to point out here that in no way does the... Even 300,000 uh, asylum seekers and illegal immigrants and, and people arriving at the border in a month... That does not constitute, under a legal definition, an invasion. Yeah. So, so for Texas to say, uh, well, we're being invaded, the federal government is doing nothing to protect us, therefore we have a constitutional right to protect ourselves, migrants are not an invading army. There is no, there's no justification to that. They're going further and saying, you know, that this is the compact argument, they, they say, that uh, basically this was used as a justification for the original civil war in 1860 that, that the federal government is not living up to its obligations to we as a sovereign state, therefore we are going to express our sovereignty and ignore anything that, whether it's the Supreme Court or, or the federal government might say or do, including wanting access to this Riverside Park. So there is there's, there's rhetoric that has become sort of a, a reality for some and the potential, we've got two armed groups yeah. who are taking orders from different masters here, which, you know, in a nightmare scenario that nobody really thinks is going to happen, could actually lead to 
American on American fighting. But meanwhile, there's a bunch of truckers coming down, a convoy, to, yeah. in quote, defend the border as well, because they're getting so worked up about this all. Yeah. Vigilantes are not going to help this situation, right? Someone yeah. could get hurt. Vigilantes, including General Michael Flynn, the, uh, <laughs> the, one, of the, one of the top election deniers, uh, and uh, in, the whole thing has been largely promoted by Alex Jones of Infowars. So, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, yeah I mean, you're absolutely right, by the way, about the law. They're, Greg Abbott has no leg. To, Greg Abbott has no leg to stand on, but Poor hasn't come words. to that. At yeah. this point in time, it's just agitating for an election because mm -hmm. they want to talk about the immigration, and there might be real consequences. So let's hope they stop. Yeah. Meanwhile, as all of that mm. nutsiness is going on down in Texas, in Washington D.C., details of a bipartisan Senate National Security Supplemental Bill are expected over the weekend. Importantly, this includes new border and immigration measures, including, we understand reportedly, a mandatory shutdown of the border if daily crossings exceed 5,000. Back in December, it was exceeding 10,000 many, many days. They want to reform the asylum seeker system to make it harder to claim asylum. They want to expedite the processing of asylum seekers. And they also plan to end the so-called catch and release of migrants. Easier said than done, of course. The Democrat Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer wants to have a vote by the middle of the week next week and that is likely to pass the Senate. There's probably already more than enough votes for this to pass the House of Representatives as well, but it is far from certain that it will ever get to a vote in the House of Representatives because Speaker Mike Johnson has basically indicated that it is dead on arrival. They're not even going to hold a vote on this. Yeah, once again, I'm going to go into so much more detail on PEP. This, this takes forever to talk through. But in summary, there's, there are three major problems with immigration in America, and there are some serious problems. The first of which is the asylum situation is just wrecked. Uh, the way the law is at the moment, if someone sets foot on American ground or goes to a port and just says, I'm claiming asylum, they use the magic words, mm. they immediately have to be processed. And it takes a long time to process someone. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to evaluate those claims. There are currently 2 million people in the queue. Look at this graph. 2 million people in the queue for their asylum claims. It's going up rapidly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's just asylum claims. Then the other immigration court claims, look at this graph. You can see the first line I'm drawing there are the ones that have been resolved. The second line is the ones that are pending. It's, it's, it's going through the roof. It's becoming exponential. And the reason for that is once they're stacked up, you have to, the law says you have to go through them properly. Mm, mm. If you don't go through them, take a shortcut, they can sue you, okay? Mm. So that's the first problem, okay? The second problem is gotaways, which are people who don't get stopped at all. We don't know who these people are. They could be security risks. Mm. The fact is they know that anyone can just claim asylum and they choose not to do that. Yeah. Because they don't want to be caught. And they're called gotaways because they are detected by cameras and other sensors mm. crossing the border. They know that they're there, they go out to find them, they can't find them, so they got away. There have been 1.7 million of them under Biden and we mm. don't know who they are. Yeah. They just go, right? Mm. And the thing about them is that the tougher you are on the border, the more gotaways there are because it squeezes mm. people out of regular migration and yep. into irregular migration. Yeah, they've and tried They've tried to get asylum perhaps in the past and they've been sent back, they've been deported for some other reason, etc. Under Trump, with all his hard his, his hard talk and hard, hard initiatives, mm. gotaways went up. Mm. Like, he he did, couldn't stop gotaways, they're hard mm. to stop. And the third thing is, <coughs> you never hear about this, there are 11 million migrants in America who are undocumented yeah. They've been 11 million for the last mm. 20 years. It never goes up. It never goes down. Mm. It, it, Trump did nothing. He didn't even put a pinprick in it. It's really, really hard to know what to deal with these people mm. because they don't want to give them amnesty because they don't want to encourage more to come over. So it's just mm. 11 million just sitting there. The more yeah. that come, the more, get the, the more go, go off to, as a little trade-off, but there's still 11 million. So they're the problems. Mm. Mm. Now, this bill you just described does a couple of really critical things. The first of one is it makes it harder to claim asylum. So it helps to close the asylum loophole. Real, genuine applicants should get through. Mm. But people who aren't genuine applicants will be harder for them to get through, which will reduce that queue that I just I put up before. That's important. The second thing you described was the shutdown of the border. This is actually the first time in history that there has been a proposal for a law where they, at one point in time, just say, no, no more applicants. Even if you are an asylum applicant, mm. we will not listen to you, we will not process you. 
That's a huge change. And, mm. it, and if it keeps the numbers down, it allows them to use their resources a bit more effectively because at the moment they don't have enough resources. Mm. They can't put them in detention because there's only 28,000 detention spots. They're getting 300,000 a month. Uh, they, they can't process them. They can't listen to their claims. There's too many of them. So they need to, to limit the number somewhat. Mm. Then mm. they'll be more effective. So that's what, this, board, this, what this, this bill does essentially. It's actually a very good bill in terms mm. of making impact. It's not going to do everything. But it'll do something. Now, what's happened is Trump has said, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I've got, I've got his quote right here, or one of them, there's many quotes. The illegal aliens are pouring into our country, are taking over our cities and attacking our police. They're forming gangs, they're tough. Close the border. You do not need a ridiculous border bill that will allow 5,000 people in our country a day. Call it the stupid bill and make sure it doesn't get passed. It will make things much worse. Close the southern border, no bill necessary. He's wrong. Everything that he did would not work now. 33 mm. out of the 35 things he tried were ruled illegal. Many of the things after mm. He, mm. He, he, he tried them, right? Uh, after his uh, administration. If Trump got in now, he would not be able to do what he thinks he can. You need yeah. legal reform. Yeah. The, the thing to say as well about, about this bill, it is a bipartisan bill. Yeah. It has uh, the support of Democrats and Republicans. They've been working on this literally for months. Mm. But... If anything, it is it is a Republican bill that Democrats have been going along with. It gives oh, yeah. Republicans a lot more than the Democrats want out of it all of this. It gives the Democrats nothing but Ukraine funding. Right, and it. it was the Republicans who linked this to Ukraine funding in the yeah. first instance. So this is it's kind of Lucy in the football. Uh, the, the Republicans have said, "We want this, we want this, we want this." They found this moment where Democrats are like, "Oh, 300,000 arrivals in December. Yes, we better take a deal. We better do something here." And now Republicans are pulling the football away, essentially saying, "Well." If Trump says he's against it, that means most House Republicans are going to be against it. They might be able to muster a majority tacking on a few people that aren't running again for re-election mm. this November with the Democrats to have it pass the House if Johnson would have let it go to a vote, but he doesn't look like he's going to let it to a vote. Therefore, if you're a Senate Republican right now, and even if you think this is a pretty good bill, as you suggest... Well, why would you vote against the presumptive nominee of your party and his wishes when he says this is a dud bill and it's not going anywhere in the House anyway, so why would I cut my own throat by supporting it? So that's where this whole thing has started to, to fall apart and it's, it's cl clearly a matter of politics because Donald Trump does not want this problem fixed this year because he wants to be able to claim to fix it next year with some even more draconian measures. The problem is those draconian measures won't work. For people mm. who say, just close the border down, zero. You don't need 4,000 or 5,000, zero. Mm. If you do zero, I'll tell you what will happen. <laughs> First of all, you'll be in breach of the Refugee Convention. Now, yeah. maybe America will, get, will, will, will pull out the Refugee Convention, but you'll be in breach of that. That's the first thing. The second thing is the godaways will go through the roof. Yeah. When you, the tougher you get, the higher the godaways. You need to have a system that makes sense yeah. That's, t that's tougher than the current system, but actually makes sense. Otherwise, the God of ways, you will not control them. And the yeah. wall will not stop it. And if you close down the border, and already they're seeing this because of just the, the sheer number of people trying to get through border crossings now, but if you shut down that border, then you're shutting down cross-border commerce, which includes a lot of Mexican workers whose job every day is over the border in Texas and then they go home at night. Uh, and there's importation, exportation, and not just fentanyl, but a lot of cross-border commerce between the two countries. Billions and billions of dollars worth of trade every month. And the final thing is that Trump, if Trump thinks he'll get this deal in a year's time, he's wrong, because the Democrats mm. have completely bent over for Ukraine funding. In a year's time, it's too late. Yeah. Uh, they will want their pound of flesh if, they, if we revisit this in a year's time. Yeah. They have not reformed immigration in 44 years. Yeah. This is not perfect, mm. but this is the first time they've done anything that might make a dent in immigration, in illegal, illegal migration in 44 years. They really shouldn't yeah. pee this away. We need Tip <laughs> O'Neill and Ronald Reagan back to get this uh, sorted out. But while Republicans are, it seems, in no danger of passing this bill through the House, uh, they are looking very, very seriously at the impeachment of the man responsible for America's border policy, mm. Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, but at this stage, it seems that there's a bit of pushback there because they can only afford to lose two Republican votes in order to have an impeachment in the House. It does not look like they're going to get those votes right now, in large part because there is no impeachable offence here. Just because you don't agree with how somebody is handling their job, there's no high crime and misdemeanour in having policy differences and there are enough reasonable Republicans who are saying, we are not going to go down the path of impeaching Cabinet secretaries 
just because we don't agree with them because they're from the other party. Yeah. There's been, I think, historically, back in the 1870s, one cabinet wow. secretary <laughs> was, was impeached, and he was a crook. Yeah. He, was, he, was yeah. selling, he was selling military contracts yeah. in the post-Civil War reconstruction period, and he'd already resigned in disgrace, even, and they impeached him mm. as he was literally going out the door. So to impeach Mayorkas uh, would be quite a, a, an extreme measure, to say the least. I'm going to be even shorter now. Mm. Um, the, uh, the, the, the two articles are, number one, not complying with the law, they say. Mm. They're talking about not detaining people. There are 28,000 positions in detention centres. There are 11 million illegal immigrants and there are 300,000 coming every month. They can't do it. Mm. If you want that many detention centres, you need to pay for them. There are no resources at the moment. That's the thing this bill does most of all. I can't believe I forgot that. This bill provides resources mm. for detention centres, for translators, for removing people. You can't deport people unless you pay for the planes. Yeah. Like, it, this provides resources that they can do. So if you, if you want him to, to not break the law, then fund him to not... He's, look, he's filling up every single spot in the detention centre. He's not breaking mm. the law. Right? Mm. And the, the other thing is false statements, saying that the border is secure when it's not, they say. Mm. You know, I mean, this, here's a fact. Biden has removed or expelled a higher percentage of the apprehensions on the border than Trump did. Mm. You might not realise that. Most mm. people don't realise mm. that. Biden has removed or expelled 51% of the migrants in, 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 in over his term that came to the border, mm. Trump removed or expelled 47% before COVID. Interesting. OK, so, so, so Mayorkas is not doing any worse, is not any less secure than Trump was, despite mm. the, the, mm. the PR. So the evidence is that after that, that spike of arrivals in December, that uh, encounters on the border have fallen by as much as 50%. We've yet to see the, uh, the data on that for the, for the month of January. But Joe Biden needs to do something here, if he's not given the money and the new laws mm. from Congress, then there are some things he can do in terms of executive action and he can find pots of money to do certain things. But it's certainly not going to be... It's not going to be big. The question is whether he's going to be seen to be doing enough to uh, at least neutralise this with swing voters, if not your kind of far-right border security nuts. This year he's deporting more people than Trump ever did. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. If, if people know as soon as they step over the border hmm. or sneak in, they can just claim asylum and they'll be here for 10 years and then they won't be able to be deported because their country isn't going to take them back at that point in time. Hmm. They'll do it. All right. And so, yeah, so you need to change the law, otherwise it's not going to work. Well, for more, we're joined by Ariel Ruiz Soto. He's a senior policy analyst at the Nonpartisan Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Ariel, welcome to Planet America's Fireside Chat. Thank you for having me. So... December last year, over 300,000 interceptions on the border. That is a threefold increase on Donald Trump's final month in office in December of 2020. So is this all Joe Biden's fault? Well, not, not precisely. I think we are seeing a very different migration flow that we, today than what we saw at the end of President Trump's tenure in office. One of the key differences that makes it significant today is that we're seeing migration from many more places farther away from Mexico, Central America, and as migrants from other places come to the Mexico border, it's more difficult to remove them or to repatriate them because the United States does not have the same type of repatriation agreements with those countries. So, for example, someone who comes from, from China, from India, from Turkey, from Ecuador, returning migrants to those places is more difficult than it was in the Trump administration to remove migrants from or to El Salvador or to Guatemala to Honduras, for example. So if a migrant comes from, say, China or Russia or Africa and the Border Patrol assesses them as not qualified to apply for asylum, what happens to that person? At the border, when the migrant presents themselves to Border Patrol, the first thing they're going to do is refer them to a USCIS officer for an interview whether they'll determine if they're eligible for protection or not. If they're not eligible for protection, they'll still be released into the United States and then go to a court hearing to begin their removal proceedings with Immigration Customs Enforcement, which is ICE. That process can take some months for that to happen if there's a repatriation agreement with, for example, in this case, China. In the event that there is not, ICE really doesn't have any other opportunity to remove those migrants unless they have citizenship or legal status in another country. So for example, in the past, there may have been migrants who had a protection or a refugee or some other liminal status in another country in South America. And then potentially, if there's an agreement with that country, let's just make an example, for example, Colombia, 
that person can be returned to Colombia. But returning migrants to Russia, China, Nicaragua is difficult because there's not a lot of uh, repatriation agreements between the United States and these countries. Now, Republicans have said that Joe Biden can close the border with a stroke of a pen. There's no new legislation required. But if he did do that, if he just said, no more asylum seekers, nothing, that's it, closed border, would that be legal? Well, see, it depends on what we mean by close the border. Uh, in fact, it's been very rare, only in very limited instances has there actually been the border closed. Uh, back in 9-11 with the terrorist attacks, there was a period of days in which the border was actually closed with Mexico. But even then, migrants were able to cross between ports of entry. It just meant that people were not being processed for entrance as they would normally. In this current day, in, in, in what we're seeing at this Mexico border, it's much more difficult to say that somebody can just close down the border for two reasons, and you pointed one to them that's important. There is a law or authority that allows the president of the United States to determine when to close for different reasons, the border, but they have to be very specific. It can't just be uh, stopping all traffic of migrants from uh, legal or irregular to the US to the, through the through the US Mexico border. But even if they did that, they have to be very careful about how they frame it so that they would not um, essentially uh, break up or, or 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 reject the current international law that the US has signed on asylum. So it is about trying to figure out had to do both. There is the, the possibility for the president to do so, but it cannot violate asylum claims in the United States. And let me be very clear about this. Any person currently in the U.S. asylum law in the United States, any person that touches U.S. immigration soil is allowed and has the right to seek, to at least apply for asylum in the United States. Whether they do it lawfully that they reach the territory or not, that is secondary to their right to do so. And so what, for example, people in Congress are debating today is, how to scale back that right, and in what cases would that make sense? Errol, the only thing that we hear more these days than the immigration system is broken is that American politics is broken. So in light of that, what do you make of the current efforts in the Senate to try and do something about the situation on the border? There's been a lot of debate and a lot of controversy about how to implement what negotiations are happening, which component is more important to the border right now, and what will in the long term look uh, the best efficiency for what we see at the border. But there are some nuggets of what's happening in there that are important that I think we should highlight. The most, perhaps the most important thing that the Congress can do is to help increase the funding for Border Patrol, for ICE and for USCIS so that these uh, agencies have more, uh, not just manpower, but also infrastructure and, for example, attention space, planes, um, trucks, and other infrastructure that is important for people to actually be processed more quickly. The problem that we have at the U.S. Mexico border today is not so much that migrants are coming in large numbers, but that the, the current system does not have enough capacity to process the number of people that are coming. If we had more capacity, migrants would more likely or more quickly and fairly be determined whether they can come into the United States to seek protection or whether they need to be, in this case, uh, be removed or seek protection in another country. If we had that with those resources, that would be helpful. So Congress can do that. The other things that are being talked about include, for example, increasing the way uh, the the country provides more quickly removals to other to other parts of the world. I think that's an important aspect of it. There's some conversations about redu or having a new authority that would trigger once there's been more than X amount of uh, border patrol or X amount of migrants arriving at the border at the border in one given day that then it automatically triggers an expulsion for anybody else that goes beyond that limit. Say that's 5,000 people, they arrive in one day, that means that after the 5,000, the 5,000 and one person will not have the same access to resources or to protection than the, the previous ones from before. But it is really, uh, at this point, more about politics than about policy, I think. And we will look to see what comes out of the negotiation and whether it does have any legs to stand on once it reaches the House of Representatives. Finally, if you had two minutes on Fox News to correct one misapprehension about migrants or immigration, what would you say? So currently, the bare minimum the United States must do is allow the opportunity for a person who is on U.S. soil to seek asylum in the United States. It is a discretionary function in some places and in some cases that the U.S. has to approve that application. But current law says that no matter how the person reached the U.S. soil, that they have to have the right to seek asylum. They could be denied. And if they're denied, they could be removed. But again, this goes back to the problem that's bigger about processing capacity. If we can process more, if we can, if we can process people more quickly, more transparently, 
then when migrants are, their protection claims are rejected, then they're more likely to be able to be returned. And for the migrants that do have meritable cases, once they're approved, then in fact, they may actually be able to integrate to the communities much faster. Ariel Ruiz Soto, thank you for having a fireside chat with us. Thank you for having me. And that's all the time we have for tonight's Fireside Chat. Planet America, back Wednesday night, 9.30pm on ABC TV. Both programs are up on ABC, iView, YouTube and Facebook. And then there's the Pet Podcast, I'm sure, Immigration for sure, in all the usual pod places right there. Bye-bye. Yeah.